Archbishop, wonderful to be with you again. And I've been peering in and peeking into the work of the committee. Um, and uh, we should say that we are here in Sumas, Washington State. I mean, almost within sight of the Canadian border for a particular reason, and I think that, that sort of deserves its own mention. Absolutely. The whole uh, task force came together up here near the Canadian border so that, in fact, our, uh, one of our two senior readers, uh, Jim Packer, uh, could be with us. Uh, Dr. Packer has been just absolutely key in this whole process from the very beginning days in, in terms of helping us to, to, to prepare a prayer book that... It, to the extent it can, unites the province mm -hmm. um, and gives all the streams a place to stand. Uh, the chair is empty here uh, because uh, Jim had a couple of brief hop hospitalizations last week. He's, he's at home. Uh, he's sadly just not well enough to travel. Um, but the truth is there's never been a time in our work when Jim wasn't present. <laughs> he's not only with us in, in spirit and in words he's spoken to us, but he's here in content. And no exception on any of the meetings, once again, uh, Jim has sent his, his, uh, his, his comments um, uh, and recommendations for the work we're doing, just like the feedback from, from right. everybody else uh, to us for, for this meeting. It's, it's such a great thing to know that he's involved in the weighty word selection and the theological underpinnings of it. Just quickly, an anecdote. Um, I attended an event um, on the, on the uh, celebration of, of his 80th birth, birthday in uh, Alabama. And um, all these people from all over the country came to give papers. And every single one of them talked about Dr. Packer's style, his classic, almost eternal style of word choice and sentences. And it's so comforting to those of us who will be end users of this prayer book that he's involved yeah. at that yeah. level. And so he, we want to help webinar participants to know that he is involved. The empty chair isn't really empty. Right. Uh, and indeed, one of the things that we're doing in, in terms of the empty chair, we'll continue to use it. It'll be filled by members of the task force. Um, it'll be filled uh, by all of the folks who've who've sent in feedback to us, and filled by webinar participants as you all um, enter into this process yeah. today and have some things to say to us about how we can uh, improve uh, the, the work that's well underway. And, and, and yesterday was such an impressive thing to sit with uh, these people and, and talk through this, this subject um, uh, that they're passionate about. I'm talking about the uh, committee. They're fully engaged in, and then we asked each one of them to sit in front of a camera and just have a word or two about their level of interest and engagement and belief in the final product. And all, all of that will be available to you on the web, uh, both these two webinars as well. So um, anyway, let, let, let's get started. Let's, let's remember why we're here. We're here to act, actually activate um, this idea of the Book of Common Prayer for the church today and also to activate your feedback. And it goes without saying that that feedback is needed and wanted and very timely. We're, in, we're at a point in this process where you have received a lot of feedback and you want a lot more. That's right. We've had hundreds of, uh, of suggestions. Uh, many of them uh, stated many times uh, what this is all about um, is and I'd, I'd, I'd remind the webinar uh, participants um, it, 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 what the charge was to the, uh, to the liturgy task force uh, at the very beginning, a period when I was the, 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 the archbishop and uh, Bishop Bill Thompson was chair of the task force. Uh, and my guidance to the committee, and this is carried through all the work from the beginning, uh, was to produce a prayer book that's so faithful and attractive that people will want to use it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so that, that's, that's been the spirit. Um, and I know you, you want us to, to, to just, again, remind folks about the vision that right. produced yeah, the movement. Let, but but let, let me be sure that we, I take care of just a few more housekeeping ideas. Uh, we will be live here for about 45 more minutes, 50 minutes or so. Um, uh, last time we checked, we were having a little problem with the Facebook feed. We will get that fixed as soon as we can, but the webinar is live, and 
50 plus, probably many more are involved in that right now. Down at the bottom of the screen, you'll see a Q&A um, feature. That's the way you can participate. You can uh, chat effectively or text in your question. And we're going to hit some highlights very briefly and then get to your questions. But um, yes, Archbishop, the, the three big watchwords for this movement were that it would be biblical, it would be missionary, and it would be um, united. And so my, my, I guess my question I want to remind our viewers about is, how does the prayer book address those things? Um, as uh, has been observed many times over many years, uh, the Book of Common Prayer is simply scripture uh, rearranged for worship. Mm -hmm. um, and so the issue for us is, is, and for the whole movement, is the centrality of, uh, of, of God's Word, of Holy Scripture. And everything we do has to be tested against what, uh, what, what the Scriptures say. Mm -hmm. um, and indeed, uh, so much of what we do is to actually put in the form of prayers uh, things that, that sound like, oh, I read that in, in this, this epistle the other day. I read that in Nehemiah this morning or, you know. So uh, biblical. And the, the, at, the, at the heart of that is the production of a lectionary. Um, indeed, the, the, the lectionary that, that's been chosen to use is uh, based on uh, the, 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 the common lectionary of uh, the 1970s, um, a, a lectionary which provides um, readings over a three-year cycle uh, and focuses um, year by year on uh, uh, Matthew, uh, Mark, and Luke with John uh, mixed in right. um, at mm -hmm. appropriate places and with the Old Testament always reflecting uh, or it, it, it symbolically related to the gospel. Right. So again, right. To, to, to read scripture and to read it in the way the church has always read it. Right. So that's that's the biblical and, and, piece. And and one of the features that was so intriguing for me to learn about was this idea of a missionary book. Um, the archbishop said that all the other prayer books that have been extant were basically um, de delivered into a land of Christendom where there were a lot of common assumptions. And this is an effort here with this book to be more missionary, not only in its prayer for mission, but also to be much more user-friendly in, in the 21st century. Absolutely. Again, uh, what we're aware of, um, and again, the values of the province, if the first one was biblical, the second one was to be mission-oriented. Um, we were committed to planting a thousand churches, but the prayer book's actually no difference. How do we take the, what we've received and um, without diminishing uh, its, it, what it what it what it gives us, what the English Reformation intended for us to have, how do we put it in 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 a, in, in ways um, and in forms that can work in the twenty first century, not just in the content of prayers, but but in the way we're we're presenting things. It's um it, it's really really that part of it is very exciting to me, as you might guess. The other part was um, united that yeah. this is a book that will gather up the. The remnants or the fragments, so yeah. to speak, right? And in some ways, th this is where we come back to, to to Jim Packer's constant word to us. How do we say something uh, in a way uh, that uh, all of the streams and the cultures in the church um, can say, I can identify that, or I can pray that, even though we have might have very different understandings mm -hmm. uh, of whether, for instance, it's appropriate to pray for the dead. Um, but to... to Place those petitions in a way that um, whatever your stream, whether it's charismatic or evangelical or ca Anglo-Catholic, um, can say, I, "I can pray. I can pray what I need to pray through those words right. that work for everybody." So this is this is a, a huge part of what we've done. So we're going to talk about the guiding principles in a moment, but I, I want to give an example of, of the challenge that's before your, you and your committee. Um, today we're talking about Holy Communion, and I want to sort of um, draw the the, uh, the camera back a little bit and look at it in terms of a big, wide angle. Um, you've already received a lot of feedback about these texts, and in some way we're in the 11th hour of receiving those texts. You have plenty to choose from, and we just want more. Um, but 
yesterday you said there were four guiding principles. You said continuity, that nothing was going to be invented. This was going to be recovered or uncovered from the past. Um, this, the text needed to be um, memorable. Um, and it had, um, had to have a certain musicality or poetry about it. And you also talked about clarity. And I, as you began to talk about these things, I, I saw a juggler um, with four balls trying to say, how do I keep all of those things true when I'm dealing with a text? And the text that we're, the, the anchor, the touch point you've said is the 1662 prayer book. I think people, the church would want to know why that is the touchstone for this work. Right. Um, the, what, uh, what was said uh, has been, and been said consistently um, uh, through Anglicanism as folks look at what we've received is that the 1662 Book of Common Prayer um, not only was but is the standard um, for worship um, uh, and for um, doctrine uh, in the church. Um, indeed, uh, so recently as the, the GAFCON, the Jerusalem station, Statement of 2008, says that it is um, the, 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 the standard uh, for Anglican uh, uh, worship uh, a, 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 and, and liturgy. Mm -hmm. um, and the fundamental principles of the, of the province say that. The challenge then is how do you take a 17th century document right. and make it work in the 21st century? And we've had as much feedback, we've had hundreds of pieces of feedback just about the Eucharist. Um, so one of the things for those who are in the, this webinar is if you're wondering whether something's been said that you really want to say and you don't hear, it, it's probably been said, it's probably right. been recorded, and we've probably been considering it. But in any case, the, 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 the standard canon is the Anglican Reformation canon. This is the, this is the thing that... Um, uh, is is a carryover of uh, Cranmer's books of uh, 1549 and 1552, and then the Elizabethan book of, of uh, 1559. Um, and, and what we've tried to do is to figure out, all right, this is our, if you will, our, our patrimony, our heritage, that how do we uh, contemporize it as much as possible uh, how do we uh, allow folks in the church to use the various orderings that are true? Right. You know, the Reformed Episcopal Church, the Anglican Church, uh, the Anglican Network in Canada, um, they never used the 1979 book, but the 1979 book r reflects a, an ordering of the, of the book that is um, what came out of the liturgical movement of the 20th century and reflects early church practice. So how do you deal with early church You're practice? You're doing it by juggling, Contain, right? Yeah, this, is, <laughs> this is this constant. That exactly right. right. Um, and we're, we're trying to juggle. And, and one of the wonderful things about this liturgy task force is folks really, um, uh, we, we, we really um, you know, argue together, vigorous fellowship, right. trying to come to the best way to to take what we've received, which is our um, theological standard and our worship standard, but make it work in the 21st century. So that's... One of the things that I want to be sure that people would understand is that the call for this uh, prayer book came from this archbishop um, nine, ten years ago, and, um, and th but Archbishop Foley Beach is fully behind this. He's asked you to chair this. He knows this group is functioning. It's an exciting thing for the College of Bishops to uh, receive these documents as they come. But let's now let's get into some some specifics, some additional um, some concerns that have been expressed. Yeah. And I'll just throw the cat in with the canaries That's fine. and uh, and say, the Lord be with you, and also with you has been changed to and with your spirit. Um, that is one of those responses that is memorized by, you know, tens of thousands of people. You're changing it. Tell us why. 
Well, we're changing it because that's what the original says. Not only the original of the prayer book, but the, the original Western response, et cum spirito tuo, is and with your spirit. Um, I'm wondering this, would it be, would be helpful? Maybe one of our I, members? I think can, so, I, yes. I would love to have Dr. Arne Klukas come up uh, and, um, uh, and just say a word to us about why uh, we've, we've done this. Um, you know, we, we're only an organization that's uh, maybe 10 years old or so, but there are a few sacred cows out there, and this <laughs> well, appears course, to be one of them. The wonderful thing about this sacred cow is it only dates to the 1979 <laughs> prayer book, and the, the tradition in the Western Church, um, the Roman Catholic Church, for instance, has gone back to, and with your spirit. Okay. Uh, Arnie? Sure. On the, in, in the 1960s, there was a real desire for an ecumenical relationship to people. And so when the Vatican II began, they encouraged Protestants to come, including Anglicans and Lutherans and other people, to come up with some common texts. And so the things we now use in the prayer book, for example, the Gloria and other parts of the service are a part of that universal text. Part of the problem, however, was that some of the people involved had agendas. And one of those agendas was to take the verticality of worship and give it a greater horizontality. And so consequently, there was a desire to make things a little more with us rather than with God. And the whole idea of the Lord be with you is, in a sense, the, the celebrant being the person through whom God's grace comes and the response of the congregation back. So it's not, hi guys, let's, let's be friendly. It's um, I am allowing the conduit of God's love to get, be, gone, be given to you, and then you respond by receiving that back. And so it's, it's not a horizontal thing, it's a right. vertical thing. And that's one of the examples. Of course, the, the, the challenge is um, we don't refer to each other as spirit. We're, we're, we're bodies we're, mm -hmm. and spirit. How, how do you plan to teach or to recover that, that um, essence of of what you're talking about. That, that's a very good, uh, good question because I think that um, we talk a lot about embodiment these days, mm -hmm. focused on the body, but we forget that we are much more than that and we are infused with the breath of God. And so consequently, spirit is a better word than ghost because of course ghost suggests you know, weird things. That and, will not fly. Yes. I, 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 I hope it does not. Um, but, but spirit means very much the breath of God in us. Right. And I think that it is important in the catechism, which teaches that very well, mm -hmm. that we're not talking here about just being friendly. We're talking about this spirit infused because we're all bound together by the Holy Spirit. And therefore, in exchanging that, it's more than our exchange. It's the exchange of the body of Christ. This, this, what you've said here about the verticality and the horizontality of our, our of our worship, it, uh, we we can go with that. That is a great concept, and I think looking back on the the uh, prayer book and the experiences that I've had uh, under the 1979 prayer book, I would have to agree that a lot of it was about celebrating life, mm -hmm. um, about you know empowering and encouraging, and that that's needed, of course. But but this introduces a a horizontality. Um, and I think part of that too is that so, so often it becomes a terrible break in the service where everybody has to greet everybody and it becomes coffee hour in kind of a nutshell mm -hmm. rather than being really <laughs> the exchange of that presence of God among us. Right. So again, right. to be God-centered. Thank you so much. We'll let you go. Um, <laughs> Sorry, my phone keeps going off because, um, and I'll tell you why, because people are chatting in all kinds of questions. So I'm, I've just silenced it, so I won't be bothered anymore, but we will get to them all. Uh, the other big issue that many people have talked about, and I know you've received uh, this feedback, is the length of the service. Um, 1662 was just a longer, longer service. How have you and your committee dealt with that? Uh, we're actually focused um, in this three-day meeting of uh, the task force on the Eucharistic texts uh, and on trying to to come to agreement, which is why the, the feedback about right. the Eucharistic text is so important to us right at this moment, um, and to, to come to agreement about what we can recommend to the bishops review panel, and they in turn uh, to the bishops, who are the, the, the final uh, authority uh, on, on matters of worship. Um, the, the, um, the, 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 the standard text which is proposed 
one of the things that's happened is it's been cleaned up. Again, many suggestions have helped to, to make it uh, uh, more sonorous, uh, more elegant. Right. Uh, things that putting uh, putting the Elizabethan uh, or Caroline language into uh, 21st century needed some more work. Right, um, right. But uh, uh, one of the things we're aware of uh, is that, um, and we're going to try to do, and indeed, uh, when the when the first texts were produced, the common the so-called common text uh, that's available to everybody and, and many congregations are using is actually a short form of the standard. Uh, it preserves the theology right. of the English Reformation and that that it, that construct and much of its language, um, but yet makes it possible to 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 for. Um, services that have to be time limited because places are being rented or because we're dealing with with new believers I mean, the, the the thing that um, uh, uh, that that was pointed out to us is that the uh, the common text which is an abbreviation of the standard text uh, is actually six words shorter than prayer a in the 1979 <laughs> prayer book uh, so we're we're paying attention to, to these issues but but the issue of the common text was to try to preserve the uh, the the English the, the right. Anglican theological uh, work, which was our peculiar gift in the in the Christian family, and, and that's that's what I mean by the the challenge in front of the committee, because the, basically the weight of our faith is contained in that Eucharistic prayer, yeah. and it could it could expand to be forty five minutes long. And yet, we do have the practicalities of, yeah. of where, where we are. The other thing that, that the committee has done, and the committee right now is wrestling with how many texts do there need to be, and how do you give the flexibility that would allow a shortening, or um, yeah. uh, how do we combine some of the best of what folks who were part of the 1979 prayer book um, uh, are, are used to. Uh, the other tradition, uh, the other worship tradition for Eucharist um, is what emerged in the liturgical movement, the ecumenical uh, convergence right. of the 20th century. Uh, and in that movement, uh, the texts that were key uh, were early church texts, uh, particularly the apostolic con uh, constitution of Hippolytus. And so uh, whatever of the, the texts, for instance, that were in Rite 2 of the 1979 prayer book, um, those texts do not reflect the Cranmerian or, or the, the English tradition, but they do reflect an earlier tradition that folks have found very useful. So the second thing we're doing is wrestling with an alternative text, uh -huh. um, which uh, reflects, uh, again, and we've had so, many, so much feedback about uh, Prayer A of uh, the 1979 prayer book, which many of our fragments are used to, but not all of them. Um, uh, and the ancient text, so-called, that, that, that is available out there is in, that, is in that same family of texts. And so right now, what the, 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 the task force is re wrestling with, based on the feedback, is how to produce a text that um, feels... Um, Feels feels like a very familiar text right, that right. many are using, but also has the, the the some additional elements, which again, according to the feedback that was in the ancient text, is were wonderful. Well, let, let me just uh, have a word to my colleagues out there who are preachers. It's a bit like preaching a sermon four times. Um, it, gets, it gets better, it gets more refined, it gets more clear. You're, you've held on to the the, the central truth, but after when it's out in public, it actually sounds different. And I, and I just have, would, would have to say to my colleagues, um, this committee is totally serious about receiving feedback, even now. They, I've seen them wrestle with this, and we'll talk about a few things on, on how they did, but uh, you can still um, give them feedback. Uh, certainly anything chatted in or texted in today will go right to them, and we'll pick up those in just a moment. But also, uh, Liturgy Task Force at anglicanchurch.net, uh, which will be up on the uh, screen as well. 
that's a, they can they can write in everything that's written yeah. in there is carefully cataloged and shared with the committee and indeed many things have been the same where the same point has been said many times mm -hmm. and so the the committee also the task force has some idea of of things which have been said many times and some things that have just been said once so let's talk about some of the things that have been suggested and and I think have been um, adjusted the fellow quick uh, yeah, let's, let's look at uh, and and I know that that um, we can put up on the on the screen the the text of the the, the Nicene Creed. Um, there's been much feedback about this because uh, this is obviously uh, the the uh, as the uh, as the uh, Chicago Lambeth Quadrilateral says this is the essential statement of the Christian right, faith. Right. Um, uh, the, the three major things that have come back to us are challenges about uh, whether it should say, as the original does, I believe. Okay. The, the 20th century okay. says, we believe. That's first. Uh -huh. uh, so that's, uh -huh. that's very useful. <laughs> and um, also whether um, it, it should read um, and in uh, the Son and in the Holy Spirit rather than three we believes, right. since we only believe in one God. <laughs> so again, the, the the committee is going to wrestle with that today. Um, but uh, it, it also, um, one of the things that have come back, uh, has come back, is the way in which we talk about the incarnatus, that is, and was made man. Um, and the, 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 the ICET text, which um, uh, Dr. Klukas uh, pointed to, um, by the power, was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. Well, all of that conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, that's not in the original. And what the College of Bishops has said to us is, you need to translate the creed in the way the original is okay. written. All right. um, and of course, we're taking it from Greek and, and, and through Latin into English. But you, 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 you and what, what, the, what the college has said and the, the resolutions available in the um, text for common prayer. You're talking about prayer. the College of Bishops. College right. of Bishops, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. Right. excuse me. The, the College of Bishops has said, we're going to attempt to translate the, 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 um, the creed um, as near as, as possible to what the original words say. So, um, uh, 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 by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, the only argument you can have with the Greek is that the preposition can be either translated as and or of. Okay. There's no other option for literal translation of that verse. Uh, what we sided with in College of Bishops was what the, the, the Church of England decided in its common worship, and they used and. Now, the, the, the point you ring, which folks want to get at, the filioque, right, right. Um, uh, the, the filioque and the son was not in the original text. However, um, Article Five of the Thirty Nine Articles say that it it the, uh, that that and the Son the double procession uh, of of um, uh, the the Holy Spirit from the Father and the Son um, that that is part of Anglican teaching at least Anglican teaching at the Reformation um, and is uh, uh, appropriate for the explication of doctrine in the Western Church. So how do we deal with this problem? Uh, and it's a matter of also ecumenical relationships. <laughs> so again, for, for the Greek church that never had this insertion, um, it's, it, it provides, again, moments of vigorous right. fellowship <laughs> and some break right. when, we, when we include that in the creed. So we're, we're trying to figure out, again, much of the feedback is it would be better to leave out the brackets. The, and the, the task force has begun to uh -huh. do this. Yeah. Um, uh, because it uh, uh, makes it appear that some piece of the creed is optional, <laughs> which uh, th this is the one debated uh, piece. Um, and so we're, we're just wrestling with how to do this. Um, again, to be utterly faithful to both the, the Anglican yeah. teaching but also the experience of the undivided church. All, and these principles, as you say, you're, you're doing juggling uh -huh. between what the, 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 the church's whole life uh, through the ages. The thing, the thing that's amazing to me is that when a person becomes a Christian, when they come to faith, they, they become people of the book, of the Bible. 
and then they have a relationship with a particular text, and the text starts to form them, so they become people of the Word. But then they get into church realities, and you find that you're, you're in a committee of, of people of words, where words matter. And I will tell you, as just an observer of this committee, they, it, they don't argue over the words, but they compare and contrast and, and shape the text according to as faithful as they can be, the words that uh, need to be there and words that were used. Um, and so again, let, words change their meaning, and so yes, some of yeah. what we wrestle with yeah. is how to say what a word meant. Miserable, I think we said yesterday, in, in, in the, the 16th century, meant uh, that those were folks who needed mercy. Right. Um, but miserable doesn't, isn't, mean that, right. doesn't work in the 21st century. That word doesn't have that meaning anymore. Right. So, so let's... Um, um, uh, ben, maybe you could come up, and, and uh, Ben has been the curator of the feedback that has been received about the texts, about the uh, Eucharistic text. Could you say a little bit more about what the big themes of suggestion or common areas have been? Yeah, um, well, there's sort of been a lot of feedback on opposite sides, uh, and this, this question of juggling. There's one saying, we need this language to be more updated. There's too many words that need explaining for someone just off the street. And then there's the other side saying, why are you changing the beautiful words and updating it? Like right. it was perfect in Cranmer, don't touch it. And so there's there's a lot of feedback on both sides um, because there is that sort of, which is it's almost impossible task. We're trying to find that happy medium, as Bishop was saying, you know, missional, uh, understandable. But there is always an element of explanation, which is catechesis, you know, for someone off the street. So... Um, matters of style have been a big uh, point of attention. So let's let me just do a quick um, um, series of, of questions because there's there's a number of them. Um, so why are we committed to the word um, oblation? Why are we committed? To <laughs> well, well, actually, we're not. Okay. We're not. <laughs> one, one of the English Reformation principles that that word was one of the things that was debated, and uh, oblation has been used. But I, I, I believe in the texts as they're emerging, it, it's not a word that is okay. going to be used. Good. That's right. my recollection. And how, um, how are you working to make the texts elegant, beautiful, rhythmic? Maybe it would be good at this point if you've got what you need yeah. from, from feedback. Well, Jonathan, uh, we, may, maybe we may bring you David, back. We may phone a friend. David, so. are you, David Pusey, you want to come and say, or, or yeah, come on. Yeah, you, you, weren't, you weren't on yesterday. Uh, David is working with our with the, the Salter subcommittee. David's working with the Collex effort. Um, speak about that kind of elegance and yeah. yet contemporaneity. Uh, yeah. So, so I think um, one of the aspects of style, you know, of of, of the the four um, uh, kind of target points, um, memorability, clarity, um, really depend on style, and and so. Um, so a lot of what we've been doing, we've been trying to contemporize, but in a way that retains a lot of the depth, um, not not reducing a concept to to sort of a bare or shallow thing. Um, and the aim the aim with that is to um, to create something that's not only timely, but something which will last a lifetime and hopefully um, hopefully beyond. So, well, in a specific way, one mm -hmm. one writer says, "Why use the word abundant instead of manifold in the prayer of humble access?" Yeah, so manifold is a car part. Right, um, I mean it, it doesn't it doesn't mean what it, it doesn't mean multifaceted. It right. doesn't mean it just doesn't mean that anymore. It doesn't mean abundant, um, and so abundant uh, retains that kind of depth, but communicates it with a clarity that I think is is far more palatable to the modern ear. Okay, so let's on that same issue, same prayer. Why depart from the historic whose property is always to have mercy? Yeah, so that's that's one. Um, I I don't know that I could speak directly to that phrase. Uh, it's one that that I believe we'll discuss um, in in the next day or two. Um, I, I believe who always delights in showing mercy is what we have now, and 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 I don't know that all of us are completely satisfied with that. Um, because but but whose property is always to show mercy. Um, that again, that's one of those phrases right. that that does not instantly communicate clearly. If if I can say about that, we've had some fairly significant feedback um, about 
the, the problems that may be associated with uh, changing that to say who always delights in showing mercy because it makes of, uh, of our Heavenly Father a, a very anthropomorphic mm -hmm. um, uh, mm -hmm. rendering. So we're still struggling that. And again, this, the feedback has really um, challenged us to just get exactly at what was it that Cranmer, who, who did um, uh, put this prayer in place, what what was his meaning that we need to translate? And how do we get to the same poetry? The good thing about manifold and abundant is that they have the same number of syllables. Mm -hmm. But 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 um, in some instances, I know that, that you will retain old language just for the sake of the fact that it is like a it's it's a it's museum, uh, it's precious. Mm -hmm. Our Father who art in heaven. Mm -hmm. We don't talk that way any longer. Uh, why make that decision about the Lord's Prayer and yet move a little bit more freely with the prayer of humble access? Yeah, so it's 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 difficult, right, to find um, to find the line uh, there. I, I think with obviously with something like the Lord's Prayer, which I think the majority of us still say in the traditional language, um, there there would be uh, you know that retaining that that language is 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 kind of an easy decision, I think. Um, with something like the Prayer of Humble Access, what you find are, are groups of people who, who are very accustomed to saying that in the traditional language, um, and groups of people who aren't accustomed to saying it at all, and for whom the traditional language is, is a real uh, uh, stumbling block as they, as they seek to enter into the liturgy. I think one of the, one of the aspects of style um, is that it can either sort of provide an entry point or it can provide a barrier. And I think um, as, as we're seeking to make this missional in that sense. Um, so anyway, all that to say, um, there, there, there isn't a hard and fast line. And so part of the, the process of receiving feedback has been um, trying to discern where those lines are exactly. Right. What, are the, uh, what are the things we retain and what are the things we, we alter? Okay. Okay. This might be a point, uh, 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 David, where it would be helpful to have Daryl Critch just say a word about the Salter Project which yeah, is sure. very much uh, this, very much at the heart of both the offices and uh, the Eucharist. Uh, Archdeacon uh, Critch is uh, the chair of the Psalter and, um, uh, and Music Subcommittee. Um, and uh, is, just say something about this and why we're trying to deal with Coverdale um, when we have a, a, a really pretty good Psalter in the 79 uh, Book of Common so, Prayer. So you used a couple words there that might need a little bit of explanation for someone who may not know the Coverdale version and the Psalms and the Psalter. Okay, so, so, so the um, the Book of the of the Psalms together are called a Psalter, which generally in Anglican worship in the offices are sung, and and so um, go to Even Song anywhere in the Church of England, evening prayer, all, all of this would be sung Even Song, and so. Um, the, the challenge with the Coverdale Psalter for us is that um, goodly numbers of people know the 1979 Psalter, but Canadians wouldn't know it, the REC people wouldn't know it, because we were still using a version of Coverdale. Coverdale is? Coverdale Psalter, right. which would be the historic one in the historic right. prayer books. Okay. And so what we're uh, attempting to do, I, I chair three quite exceptional scholars, just for encouragement's sake, because I'm not a Hebrew scholar, I'm a musician and a parish priest, um, Travis Bott, who's the Old Testament professor, uh, Hebrew professor at Neshoda, yeah. mm -hmm. Erica Moore, who's at Trinity, and John Crutchfield, who has a PhD in Hebrew, um, teaches at uh, a Bible college in South Carolina. The three of them together are weighing through line by line, looking at um, Coverdale Psalter and, and um, trying to, to deal with some of the Coverdaleisms, as we're calling them, where he has um, further explanations of things which aren't directly in the Hebrew, Sometimes it's in the Septuagint, sometimes not. Um, and they're struggling with what portion of that should be kept to, re to retain the, the, the common phraseology, which, which for most of Anglicanism would be fairly well known, in actual fact, apart from the American church since the 79 prayer book. And so, so we're, we're together working on how we might uh, retain that poetic language um, where it's not inconsistent with the Hebrew. And, and again, maybe for people, because I, I think the Psalter is so central to, yes, to what we yes. do um, that, that, that the, the, um, the, the, the key thing uh, in this uh, renewed Coverdale is to put it in contemporary idiom 
So, you know, he hath said, <coughs> he has said. Um, or he, or, or, you know, again, any of the archaisms in verb form or in a personal address for, for, for the Godhead are, are, are put in modern, just like the rest of the prayer book. Um, uh, the other piece that, that um, it, it excites Archbishop Beach so much, uh, he mentions it in office, uh, uh, is that this was, a, this was attempted once before uh, with a report in 1963, of which uh, C.S. Lewis and T.S. Eliot were, were principal proponents. Um, and so we're just using Eliot and Lewis as part of our committee. <laughs> <laughs> and again, this, if, if this works, it will be an incredible gift to the whole Anglican world, just as our catechism has been an incredible gift to the whole Anglican world. I, I, don't, know, I don't know that it's true everywhere, but um, since I... Um, stepped away from Christchurch and am out in the field a little bit more and visiting churches. Um, I feel like the Psalms are losing ground in terms of how they're used and if if they're even even used on a Sunday morning. Um, as rector of a church, I would say, on, I mean, declare myself guilty. It was they weren't central. Maybe during times of special um, observances, is it the intent of the uh, prayer book um, uh, to recover their use and to be be more central to the worship life of the church. Well, it'd be very difficult to pray the offices without the psalms, right? And, and Anglican priests make vows to pray morning and evening prayer every day. More and more parishes are trying to do this publicly, so so that um, the Psalter by virtue of its being the center part of the offices, will get used more and more. And our uh, the lectionary certainly requires that there's a psalm every Sunday morning in the context of the Eucharistic celebration. And and so um, what, I, what I, as a musician, am hoping is that we will get back into the pattern of singing the psalms, and, and I think that Coverdale's translation will help some of that, perhaps. Okay. I think the, 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 the other piece uh, of this for, for, for the life of the, the, the church um, is that uh, the the Saint Augustine of, of Hippo uh, uh, said that the Psalms were the voice of the church. Um, they actually express human emotions mm -hmm. and give you permission in ways that the rest of Scripture doesn't to be mad at God, <laughs> or to be glad with God, or to be angry, you know, right. <laughs> or to be sad with God. <laughs> and this 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 is just the way faithful people throughout the ages um, have express themselves in words that our Lord himself used, um, since the Psalter was his hymn book, um, for, uh, for talking to his father. Uh, so that this, they, they need to be recovered in some measure um, uh, for a healthy church. Right. And I, I, I would just have to say, though, it, my experience is um, that they are uh, losing ground. Absolutely. Um, so it would be I think a gift back to the church if there were a way forward. To me, when I've read them aloud, they always, of all, of, of all scripture that that is read in church, usually I feel like I've got to explain this one, the the the, the Psalms, because they're they're intense, um, and they they they're evocative, and sometimes they are making uncomfortable. And if you take the vision that God gave to the Anglican Church in North America being biblical, missionary, you know, and united. Yeah, yeah. The biblical piece, if we want to be biblical Christians, we have to know the Psalter, and we have to be able to pray the Psalter. So that's that's really true. Thank you so much for, for being, because I know you've got a lot of other oh, questions. Yeah, there's, there's a, an, another uh, a question is, okay, um, why not just make a book that is a compilation of the REC the Canadian uh, prayer book and the what's in use in the in the United States, um, and call it a day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's presently where we are <laughs> without the book. Right. Um, the 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 issue again here is how can we ha be a church that has a common language? Um, so much of the history, uh, for those who've been Anglicans over a long, we, we turn our phrases, indeed, um, uh, that so much of, of Christian literature uses the phrases of the prayer book. So having this um, as part of everybody's recitation, so no matter where you go in the Anglican Church in North America, um, you actually are at home uh, and you speak the language of the people that you're with. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. 
This is, and, and again, this is so important cross-culturally because as we attempt to do, and in, in North America, particularly um, uh, Hispanic and Asian ministry, um, Hispanic in the U.S. and Asian in right. Canada, um, uh, to have a text allows it to be translated into those languages and given to those people that, whom we're trying to reach. Yeah, wonderful point, actually, a really wonderful point. Uh, that a common book will allow us to have a common expression overseas or into other ethnic groups. Um, very good, very good. I um, what one one um, brother here asks about the um, the Psalm translation. Um, is there a poet on the translation? Uh, well, well, I could say that. T.S. Eliot <laughs> would be a, 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 a pretty commendable poet. And since what the Psalm Committee is doing, Coverdale is there, the, it, it, uh, Eliot and Lewis and six others in the Church of England attempted to do this. So it was heavy in the poetry stuff. And what our scholars are doing is, is looking at the Hebrew and then seeing if Coverdale's accurate and looking at how the 63 team dealt with it. So yeah, we have a, we have a really um, gifted poet as okay. part of this effort. Um, but I think this, the spirit of the question is, is there someone on the, on the task force that, or do you have access to um, a, a final editor that is putting everything into a, a flow that, that is beautiful. Again, the flow isn't the problem, because uh, with Coverdale, the flow tends to be um, very musical, very okay. poetic. Um, what the the problem is 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 the way in which he translates words, um, uh, and um, what we're what we're struggling with is um, what what will what will carry his meaning into the 20th century. And where it's clear what his meaning is, we're leaving it alone. What, we'll, what we intend to do, and we'll, we'll decide at this meeting, because we have, uh, the, the scholars have now got the mean, that they've, they've figured out what their values are mm -hmm. in doing these, these translations related to the right. texts that have been received. Uh, their act, uh, what we've decided is, we're, uh, or will decide, is, is how to put these texts out to the church to use and let the church and its poets, who've done a very good job with us on feedback on things that didn't work mm -hmm. and weren't mellifluous, weren't poetic, weren't musical, uh, they'll come back to us and we'll be able then to see what things need to be adjusted about the scholar's work. This is a that, very participatory Right, uh, and I think process. that's a really good point. And you made it uh, very well yesterday. We haven't uh, talked about it today. But the hope would be that those who respond with suggestions are actually practitioners. They're, they're using the texts. They have stood in front of people and led congregations with the texts. So they see where the little maybe hiccups or potholes are, and they can refer those back to you. Um, what, one other question, and I think we'll probably wrap it up with this, is um, in the prayers of the people, typically in the U.S. church, we pray for the president, and Canadian churches would pray for the prime minister. Um, but we also recognize we're in a land where a lot of immigrants have uh, come um, and uh, maybe Canadians would pray for the Queen as well. Well, right? that's right. In so, the prayers of the people, it right. says so how, President, Prime Minister, Sovereign in okay, the fill okay, in the bank. Sovereign, sovereign okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Duly noted. But we have people from all over the world that are in our churches recognizing we're not a state church. Um, how do we include them in the prayers for the Sovereign, the President? How do we include the leaders of their countries? Is that even a consideration? Um, would... Uh, uh, maybe uh, I'm just thinking whether somebody who's really worked on the prayers of the people would like to respond to that. Um, uh, I don't know, Bishop Keith. Do you want to just say, say uh, you you haven't been in front of the webinar at all? Bishop Keith is a, the former vice president, and he's the, the, along with Jim Jim Packer, the senior reader. Thank you. Well, the prayers of the people really are an extraordinary opportunity for us to draw all of the concerns of the church. The uh, Gregorian, uh, the Eucharistic prayers and the Mass uh, in Rome called the Tridentine did not have prayers of the people in it. And Cranmer knew that we had to have the prayers of the people. 
So Cranmer reinserted into uh, the 1549 book, and I say reinserted because he was a compiler, not right. an author of all things. And he brought in the earlier usages of the Eastern Church where the prayers of the people were actually the processional hymn. And people came walking in singing, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. And all the needs of the congregation became specific. The original intention was not to have one form of the prayer for the whole state of Christ Church that would catch everything. Mm -hmm. And our dilemma was when we got to the one section where we prayed for all Christian rulers, and at one point somebody turned to me and said, all six of them. <laughs> <laughs> and so we determined that in order to get the sense of the earlier prayers right. of the people, which were to be the immediacy of the needs of the people, we needed to have prayers that would allow for that expanse. Now, the other point we make is that was always the task of the deacon, who in the Eastern Church to this very right. day stands in the midst of the people and prays on behalf of all the people, among the people. Mm -hmm. At that point, national tragedies, difficulties, other kinds of things can be worked right into it. So we have attempted to take the historicity of these prayers, but at the same time allow for the flexibility of the circumstances. Wonderful. And Bishop Ackerman, while you're here, you said something to me yesterday I think deserves repeating, that you participated in other liturgical um, commissions, but this one, you said something like, uh, this one is actually not trying to change theology, but to recover what is ours. Can, can you say something more about that? Yes, I'd be happy to. Uh, innovation is a very dangerous thing. Psychologically speaking, it takes three generations for a root metaphor to be altered, which means that some of the root metaphors which are in the 79 book, for example, are now being held by people today as being reality rather than alterations, mm -hmm. and that's what we're seeing. So our task is to go back to the original, to the real root metaphors, examine them, and make sure that we maintain them because as was very clear in some of the words of uh, St. Paul to St. Timothy. He did not give him, St. Paul did not give him his version of the gospel. Mm -hmm. He gave him the gospel. Right. And so our task, and indeed the task of bishops in particular as guardians of the faith, is to make sure that there is no innovation or alteration to that which has been trusted to us. Mm -hmm. And that's why we Anglicans are really big on the lex orandi, lex credende part. And the reason why we spend as much time as we do on words is because there's a principle behind every single word. That's, I have to affirm that. That has been so evident here as I've seen the committee work and, and uh, adjust the, the words mm -hmm. themselves. And it's been absolutely amazing to see. And I know every heart on the committee, their desire is to give a gift to the Anglican Church in North America that will be used and embraced. And that will be a task, won't it? Because we all have our hobby horses and favorite books and sayings like that. But the task also, Father David, is this, that just as the 1662 became a unifying focus because it's the last book of common prayer that all Anglicans had in common, that is to say, once provincial structures came into place, then prayer books for those provinces occurred. This prayer book we pray will go just like the catechism has, beyond its borders. Mm -hmm. As Archbishop has said on numerous occasions, to be offered as a gift. And if there are others who wish to use this gift, we want to be able to say that the gift we're offering is an authentic gift. Mm -hmm. That's, it's, it's been a beautiful thing for me to think about what the church would look like in 20 years if a common prayer uh, book is established and embraced and in the households of our children and our, our grandchildren. And I think we'll, we'll leave it there. Um, I, I, I don't know, uh, Archbishop, if you want a final word, but I, I do want to first give thanks to God for uh, Bishop uh, Bill Thompson, who began this work under your leadership uh, to Archbishop Foley Beach, who recognized that it had to continue and appointed Archbishop Duncan 
uh, give thanks to God for Archbishop Duncan himself and J.I. Packer and the, the liturgy task force that has been so um, committed to this and their readers and their subcommittees, uh, their review panels and the reading groups. Um, Colby Kerr, my colleague at uh, LeaderWorks, has organized these webinars. And um, maybe you have the final word. I'd, I'd love that. Well, again, to, to, to share with everybody who's been part of these webinars um, that, again, that, that uh, charge at the beginning to produce a prayer book that's so faithful and attractive that people will want to use it, that builds up the, the, the biblical grounding, uh, the missionary um, work, um, and the unity uh, uh, of the church that does this juggling between uh, uh, continuity and memorability and poetry uh, a, 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 and um, uh, the clarity, clarity uh -huh, right. um, that, that that's what's going on here. And as everybody assesses this and makes contributions, the, 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 the really important thing has been all through this process, the empty chair, there has never been, I, I'm sure it's safe to say, the preparation of a prayer book that has been as participatory as this one has. A modern technology has enabled us to, to put no filters between the folks who have a, a, a thought and the, the, the task force that's responsible for, for evaluating and incorporating those thoughts. So this is, uh, please, please, we're we're, we're, we're attempting to finish up the offices and Eucharist um, through the course of this year, 2017. Next year, all the rest of the prayer book texts. So please, friends, uh, if you've got immediate stuff on offices or Eucharist, get it um, to Liturgy Task Force uh, at anglicanchurch.net and then use the rest of the texts. I mean, this great treasure chest that's out there and 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 help us because in 2018 we'll be doing another webinar another, i'm sure or yes, series yes, of webinars yep. and we'll we it will we will be vastly help if we with all the feedback um it, even more than we've had so far on special liturgies and on pastoral liturgies and on the psalter and so on thank you archbishop and thank You're you welcome. for watching um a final reminder this will be um its own um video recording and you will get information about where to find it. You can re-watch re it and then as I say we've had interviews with all the members of the task force that will be available to you as well. So thanks for watching. Uh, I'm David Roseberry, Executive Director at LeaderWorks and God bless you. Thanks. <laughs>